Faccio una brevissima presentazione sui concetti generali delle dei trattamenti epigenetici del cancro, un argomento che mi, di cui mi interesso da molti anni, partendo dall'osservazione che il microambiente embrionario è in grado di controllare la crescita tumorale e di far revertere a un comportamento normale le cellule tumorali. Studiando questo aspetto della regolazione epigenetica del cancro, in effetti abbiamo scoperto che i fattori che sono in grado di differenziare le cellule staminali normali sono anche in grado di riprogrammare le cellule tumorali. Questo avviene perché appunto questi fattori sono in grado di regolare l'espressione genica di vari geni coinvolti nel cancro, in generale nelle malattie tumorali non si tratta di un solo gene alterato nel creare questa patologia ma di molteplici geni e quindi noi usiamo questo network di proteine che sono esattamente i fattori prelevati in specifici momenti in cui diversi tipi di cellule staminali si differenziano e per questo noi abbiamo utilizzato l'embrione di Zebrafish che è il modello di studio per appunto studiare il differenziamento delle cellule staminali, abbiamo preso i vari eh, fattori nei precisi momenti in cui le cellule si differenziano da prima da totipotenti a pluripotenti, poi multipotenti, oligopotenti e così via, fino alle cellule completamente differenziate e abbiamo visto che questi fattori sono in grado di regolare alcuni geni oncorepressori in modo particolare, di attivare in modo trascrizionale l'oncorepressore P53 bloccando il ciclo cellulare delle cellule tumorali e poi facendo due cose tentando di riparare i danni che sono all'origine della malignità e se i danni non sono troppo gravi e sono riparabili vengono effettivamente riparati e le cellule si ridifferenziano noi abbiamo visto appunto un aumento considerevole dei marker del differenziamento come le caderine dopo il trattamento con i nostri fattori Oppure, se le alterazioni sono troppo gravi e non sono riparabili, vengono attivati i geni della morte cellulare programmata e le cellule muoiono. Quindi o che muoiono o che si differenziano, l'importante è che escono dal giro della moltiplicazione. Questi sono i concetti generali di questa terapia epigenetica effettuata in modo specifico e utilizzando i regolatori presenti in natura e in modo particolare nel preciso momento in cui la vita si forma. Questo è avvenuto perché studiando l'attività dei cancerogeni ambientali nell'indurre un tumore si è visto che appunto quando venivano somministrati nel momento dell'organogenesi, quindi nel momento in cui le cellule staminali si differenziano, non si riesce mai a indurre tumori nella prole, appena finita l'organogenesi la somministrazione delle sostanze cancerogene induce tumori nella prole. Quindi questo ci ha portato a individuare tutta una serie di fattori del codice epigenetico, si tratta in generale per il 98% di proteine a basso peso molecolare, con un peso molecolare che va per il 50% fino a 40 kD, per il resto fra 40 kD e 95 kD. Quindi sono piccole proteine che possono essere assorbite sotto la lingua e che noi utilizziamo appunto nel, nelle terapie integrate, nei trattamenti integrati, perché questi non si comportano, come avete capito, come farmaci, ma sono sostanze che si comportano e, e, e regolano il metabolismo delle cellule staminali normali e patologiche come quelle tumorali, riprogrammando e ricorreggendo i danni genetici che sono all'origine della malignità. Ma non agiscono con meccanismo farmacologico ma biologico, quindi non sono farmaci, sono integratori. Da questo punto di vista, quindi, eh, diciamo così, questa è una terapia specifica. Con il professor Ablin noi abbiamo già pubblicato un lavoro appunto, che riguardava le terapie epigenetiche del cancro in un recente articolo comparso su Current Medicinal Chemistry un anno fa e i risultati sono stati molto interessanti. Oggi però il professor Ablin ci parlerà un po' più diffusamente delle terapie epigenetiche del cancro anche in rapporto alla dieta e alla nutrizione perché com come sappiamo oggi tutto conta nel regolare l'espressione genica, non solo in modo specifico e più determinante questi fattori che sono specifici regolatori genici, ma in generale la dieta e tutto il nostro comportamento, il nostro stile di vita, le nostre emozioni, eccetera, incidono sull'espressione genica. Quindi tutto conta e quindi diventa molto importante conoscere i comportamenti che possano aiutarci 
a correggere gli errori a cui andiamo incontro nella vita, che ci portano alle malattie croniche degenerative o al cancro, e evitare invece quelli che ci danneggiano. Questo è il concetto di fondo. Dal mio punto di vista, quello che stiamo facendo adesso è di utilizzare in modo razionale questi fattori epigenetici che hanno effetti anche molto diversi, perché abbiamo visto che da un lato noi siamo in grado di rallentare la moltiplicazione cellulare, differenziare le cellule, inducendone magari l'apoptosi. Da un altro, cioè i fattori presi per esempio nella fase iniziale del differenziamento, allorché le cellule staminali totipotenti si differenziano in pluripotenti, quindi nel momento di medioblastula gastrula, quelle proteine tengono attivi i geni staminali e impediscono l'invecchiamento. Quindi da un lato noi andiamo dalle terapie anti-aging fino alle terapie di differenziazione e di eh, induzione della morte cellulare programmata. Tra questi due estremi c'è la possibilità di rigenerare i tessuti in quanto, diciamo così, nella rigenerazione tessutale noi dobbiamo dare l'informazione completa che è all'origine della vita. Cioè dobbiamo dargli l'informazione dall'inizio alla fine e simulare esattamente il processo che dà origine alla vita. Cioè dobbiamo utilizzare tutto il codice epigenetico, cioè tutte le proteine presenti nei cinque stadi del differenziamento. In questo modo che cosa succede? Che prima noi teniamo attivi il serbatoio staminale e poi differenziamo le cellule staminali e le facciamo diventare cellule del tessuto nervoso, piuttosto che cellule del miocardio, eccetera. E quindi da questo punto di vista siamo in grado di ricostruire i tessuti in modo fisiologico, naturale. Questi sono i concetti eh, essenziali della terapia epigenetica. Ma adesso di, diamo la parola al professor Ablin e eh, vediamo se è possibile appunto conoscere il suo punto di vista per queste terapie nei confronti del cancro della prostata. Abbiamo già fatto un articolo in questo senso, come dicevo. Uh, good morning, professor Ablin. We want to uh, uh, tell you, uh, uh, speak with you about this treatment and you Uh, can illustrate to us uh, your point of view in this kind of treatment in prostate cancer. Please, Professor Ablin, you can begin your uh, lecture. I don't know because I wasn't present. Uh, unfortunately, at some of the other sessions on nutrition and cancer. But it's interesting to take note that Hippocrates, who is viewed by some as the father of Western medicine, Uh, advocated the healing effects of food and as a quote from him let food uh, be thy medicine so as early as the time of Hippocrates um, people were thinking about food now in 1992 uh, there was a landmark presentation by uh, Gladys Block Uh, on fruit, vegetables, and cancer prevention. This is the first time, uh, this was a compilation of about 200 uh, papers that have been published uh, suggesting the use of uh, diets rich in fruits and vegetables to inhibit um, various types of cancer. And I thought that this is important, this being a conference on Uh, nutrition to take uh, note of this landmark publication. Now one of the difficulties that we've noted over the years with regard to studying the effect of diet, food, nutrients, uh, or nutritional studies is that, uh, as shown on this slide, there's There's an inherent heterogeneity of the study population, um, variations in individual lifestyles, quantitative and qualitative complexity in food and food products, and then we have the difficulty of translating the data from animal studies to humans, which is often fraught with error. So <coughs> as we read the literature, Um, some of these difficulties explain why there's many contradictory reports that appear in the literature that confuse physicians as far as making a definitive decisions as well as, of course, the public. Now, I found it interesting that when I 
began some of my early work in prostate cancer, which dates back to about 1967. When I got up to about 2000 in my work, I noticed that there were a number of nutrients um, which are shown on your left going down garlic, green tea, lycopene, which were suggested to have an anti-cancer action and some of the research, the conclusions, and some of the suggested doses. Also, um, there were herbs and nutrients that were suggested to use in combination with conventional cancer therapies. Now, since these early days, I think we've come quite a, a way in the sense that in the recent paper uh, published earlier this year, we see the interaction between food and nutrition and various physiological processes, DNA repair, cell cycle, apoptosis, differentiation. So we see here that the message continues that food and nutrition play a significant role and particularly that they're linked to cancer. Now, part of our title and our topic today is prostate cancer. And I think it behooves us to take a few minutes for just a brief glimpse at the problem that we're faced with because I think this, this gives us a better appreciation of what we're hoping to try to achieve with the effect of nutrition on, on epigenetics. So as the father is explaining here, I think it's clear to his son, men have four problems in life, son, women, money, booze, and the prostate. And taking a look here uh, at the incidence and mortality rates of prostate cancer, um, this data is from 2012. Unfortunately, as you know, we're always several years behind, but in looking at Italy, uh, and I don't know how well these figures may jive with some of the figures that you presently have, but in terms of 100,000 people, we have an incidence of prostate cancer of 101 and a mortality rate of 14. A particularly interesting characteristic of prostate cancer, which tells us something about the disease. And it's important that in our studies, be they nu nutrition or other areas, that we have an understanding of the disease that we're studying. Now, the purpose of this slide is to show you that the ratio of the incidence of prostate cancer to mortality is seven to one. So in the United States, we have about 210, 20,000 new cases diagnosed a year, and we have about somewhere between 28 and 30,000 deaths. So what this is telling us, this is telling us that the incidence of prostate cancer <coughs> is quite higher than the mortality. And when we look at this in comparison to breast, colorectal cancer, and lung, we see a reverse ratio. And for example, in breast cancer, um, the ratio, instead of it being seven to one, um, is, is their incidence is four to eight. And so this is important because what this tells us and suggests to us in regard to prostate cancer is that host factors, and hopefully, possibly, dietary, nutritional factors, are playing a role in this disease. Because there's more people living with prostate cancer than there are dying from prostate cancer, which of course is not the case, for example, in breast. Now, one of the things that's important is we look at risk factors. And we know that the established risk factors are age, ethnic origin, and family history. But what we're coming to understand 
is that when we consider the global variability in the incidence and the mortality of prostate cancer, for example, there's a 25 time difference in the incidence of prostate cancer as we go across the world and a 10 time different incidence in mortality. This suggests to us that environmental factors portend to have an impact on prostate cancer. Now nutrition and bioactive dietary components are thought to be the most influential when we think of environmental factors due to their ability to affect the transcriptional activity and expression of select genes. So that it's now coming to the forefront that in addition to the established factors of age, ethnic origin, and family history, environmental factors are highly suggested to play a role which brings us closer to taking a look at the effect of nutrition on epigenetics and prostate cancer. Now we know that the inter and intratumoral environment or microenvironment is very important in modulating tumors with respect to gene expression and the phenotypic properties of tumor cells. Now, while they may not induce malignancy, they may permit activation of a quiescent tumor and compromise the host control. The first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the immune response. Thereby, the microenvironment may be permissive. Now, an, an example of this is that if we look at what we call the histological incidence of prostate cancer, and we compare the histological and clinical incidence of prostate cancer in the United States and Japan, it's interesting that we note that histological cancer or latent cancer is almost identical between Japan and the United States. However, when we look at clinical cancer, we see that with an increase in age, there is also an increase in the incidence of clinical cancer in the United States versus that in Japan. So for example, some of the classic studies have shown that when a man from Japan moved to Hawaii and then moved from Hawaii to Los Angeles, that the incidence of prostate cancer in those people took on the incidence of those in the United States coming back again to suggesting that environmental factors play a role in prostate cancer and again possibly implicating because the difference in diet between Japanese and American men that here nutrition may play a significant role. Now when we look at race and ethnic difference in the biology of prostate cancer, we can see we just take one example that using DNA methylation, which we'll talk about subsequently, and we look at the increased prevalence of what we call CD44 hypermethylation in African American tumors, and the increased prevalence of glutathione hypermethylation in African Americans. So as we go down the list here on your left, we can see that the trend again in looking at race and ethnic differences in the biology of prostate cancer point to some significant differences. Now, the development of cancer is controlled by genetic and epigenetic changes. And some of the key points are illustrated on this slide, which I won't go through each one, but to point out that these are some of the factors or key points, as I mentioned, 
that contribute to the genetic and epigenetic changes in prostate cancer. And as noted here, uh, the authors of, of this paper say that prostate cancer is an excellent model of an epigenetic catastrophe in which epigenetic changes occur during the earliest stages of tumor initiation and are maintained throughout disease progression. Therefore, it suggested that prostate cancer is an excellent candidate for chemo prevention using modulators of epigenetic mechanisms. Now, the dilemma that we're faced with here as we move forward in trying to get a, a, an understanding of the role of nutrition on epigenetics and prostate cancer is that we've had certainly significant improvements in the treatment modalities for prostate cancer. However, we still find a subset of patients, in some cases as high as 35% or more, that manifest progression of disease even following definitive treatment. And two examples in those cases are we are able to identify what we call androgen receptor splice variants and neuroendocrine features. And the difficulty here is, is that these patients, because of these two examples, become resistant to further treatments that are available. Therefore, targeting epigenetic mechanisms may represent a novel strategy in anti-cancer therapy. So, what I want to try in the remaining time here, given this, the background of nutrition and prostate cancer and the role of environmental factors implicating diet and nutrition, is to take a look at the concept of epigenetics. And epigenetics refers to DNA or associated proteins other than DNA sequence itself. In other words, there are modifications of DNA or associated proteins other than the modifications of the DNA sequence itself. Presently, there are three recognized mechanisms or epigenetic mechanisms. The first is DNA methylation. The second is histone modification or sometimes it's referred to as chromatin remodeling. And the third is microRNA, or as many of you see in the literature, miRNA. Now, this slide, what we're looking at here, is we're looking at as normal cells become differentiated and become invasive cells, what we're seeing here in green are some of the factors that possibly through epigenetics and modifications, we can alter these. For example, we can't do very much presently about ethnicity, family history, increasing age, or gender, which if you remember a few minutes ago, some of these are some of the risk factors associated with prostate cancer. But as the subject of today's talk is that nutrition is one modifiable factor that through modifications in nutrition, we may be able to modify the development and progression of prostate cancer. Now, Nutritional epigenetics is the investigation of how diet influences DNA methylation, histone modification, and the expression of non-protein coding microRNAs, and the resulting effects on the genome stability and cell proliferation. Now, what do we mean by an epigenetic diet? 
Epigenetic diet is a term that was coined to refer to the consumption of select foods, for example, soy, grapes, crucifix vegetables, and green tea, which have shown to induce epigenetic mechanisms that protect against aging and cancer. Now, in a recent study, a physician's health study, a group of men diagnosed with prostate cancer were given two diets. They were given what was called a, a prudent diet which consisted of legumes, green vegetables, fruit, crucifix vegetables, tomatoes, whole greens, garlic, and versus another group who were maintained on the traditional Western diet which of processed meats, red meats, eggs, high dietary f fatty products. And then there was a comparison following these two groups on these two diets with regard to the all-cause, the, the prostate mortality and all-cause mortality. That is, was there a difference in the number of men who were dying from prostate cancer and all-cause mortality, meaning they were not necessarily dying from prostate cancer, but they may be dying from cardio, uh, cardiovascular disease. And what was found was is that those men who followed what was referred to as the prudent diet had a significantly lower incidence of mortality from prostate cancer and all-cause mortality than those who were on the Western diet. Now, there are a select group of about five enzymes that are involved in epigenetic regulation. The DNA methyltransferases, histine acetylases, histone deacetylases, histone methyltransferases, and histone demethylases. So this is a, a, a mouthful or, uh, to try to remember. But let's look at Remember we said there were three examples or mechanisms here. So in the first case, what we're looking at here is we're looking at that the effect of nutrients from selenium, Brazilian nuts, eggs, wine, uh, and soybeans, soybeans, excuse me, which have the ability um, to inhibit the DNA methyltransferases which have resulted in the methylation of these proteins. So these dietary components can inhibit the DNA methyltransferases. And this is one example. In the second example that we have, we have what we call the modifiers of histones. On your left, we have the histone acetylases and the histone deacetylases. So over here on your left, what we see is, is that we see that the, the chromatin is transcription, deacetylation, has resulted in the transcription being turned off. That is, the genes are silenced and repressed. Over here, what you can see is, is that the chromatin is open versus being closed, and transcription is on, and gene activation is proceeding as it normally would function. And again, we have some of the modifiers here as shown um, in genistin, egg, etc. Now lastly, we look at the dietary effects of miRNAs, and we see here that these components have the ability to block oncogenic messenger RNA. This is bad, and they have the ability 
to unblock this so that the tumor suppressor genes are available so that they may function as they normally do. So those are but three examples of the three mechanisms that are involved in the epigenetics. Now, certain dietary uh, polyphenols, which are shown on this slide, and the active portion of the particular component is indicated in red, have been suggested to be very relevant in terms of diet to abrogating the negative effects that we just saw. So what we're looking at here, we have different dietary components on your left, genistin, for example. We're looking at their structure. We're looking at the source of food. In this case, it's soy and fava beans. And we're looking at the epigenetic function. And so we're seeing that genistin has an effect on DNA methyltransferases and some of the other enzymes that are involved. For those of you who are interested in more detail, and I will refer you to the paper, um, the reference shown here at the bottom of the slide, is that if we pick uh, curcumin, we can see here that the epigenetic modifications um, our histone acetylation and DNA methylation and the target and the mechanisms are explained here and the fate of the cancer cells is that the growth inhibition and apoptosis. Now diagrammatically we're looking at what's going on in with cells under abnormal DNA methylation, um, which has to do uh, with prosthetic um, inflammatory atrophy, PIA. We see normal cells which are affected and become turn in from normal to PIA. Then we have the occurrence of DNA methylization as we've seen in the previous slides, or what is referred to as a catastrophe. And then the cells with epigenetically silenced genes undergo clonal selection to form prostate cancers. In continuing here, we see that you have a primary prosthetic cancer, which has been affected as shown in the previous slide, which results in various stages of metastatic disease. Now, what we know is, is that there are a number of genes in prostate cancer that have become methylated. That is, as a consequence of becoming methylated, their normal function has been abrogated. So what we're seeing here on this slide, we're seeing the pathways that are involved, the name of the genes, their designation and the frequency for which they occur. So you may recall I mentioned earlier glutathione S transferase. So this occurs in 79 to 95% of patients with prostate cancer. So one can hopefully envision that through nutritional dietary factors, we may be able to demethylate or unmethylate these genes so that they can return to normal function. Now, this is a summary of some recent data, which I thought was important to bring to your attention. The dietary component being shown on your left and the epigenetic function. So I, I won't read through this, I'll let you look through it, but for example, with lycopene, it's very striking that lycopene has the ability to demethylate the promoter of glutathione so that it reactivates this protein 
so that it continued to function as a tumor suppressor. That is, it can suppress the growth of tumors. When it becomes methylated, it loses its ability, loses its ability to function in that capacity. Now, the thing that was particularly interesting about this study, and something further to follow up, is that this demethylation of GSTP1 was related to the androgen status of the individual. In other words, those patients who were androgen dependent versus those patients who were androgen independent, there was a difference in the ability of lycopene to demethylate the GSTP1. And these are some other examples of genistin, flavone, and selenite, and isothiocyanate. Now, what I tried to do here, I looked in the literature, and I was trying to look. There's been a lot of studies, as I mentioned at the outset, that have been done in experimental animals. But if you think back to the list that I showed you at the beginning, there are a number of factors that make it very difficult to translate what we see in experimental animals to man. Now, excuse me, I went to what we have here. I'm not, I'm, I'm not certain what you have in Italy, uh, and I'd be interested to know. But we have what we call clinicaltrials.gov. And I'm holding uh, one of the printouts in part from the slide that I'm showing you. And what I did is I went through a number of these clinical trials, trying to find some dietary components, nutrients that were studied with regard to their effect on epigenetics. I came across this one study for which the status was unknown in which sulfoforphane was utilized and when I went to the study itself I found that the investigators were able to show that sulfoforphane which is an isothiocyanate found in crucifix vegetables inhibits, as we saw in a schematic or a cartoon example, histone deacetylases in human colorectal and prostate cancer cells. The unfortunate part here is that the study, uh, the status of the study uh, was unknown. I subsequently went uh, again, going back to clinicaltrials.gov, trying to find other studies, uh, I did come up with another study uh, where lycopene was looked at in its effect on the level of lycopene in patients with prostate cancer and benign prosthetic hypertrophy. Unfortunately, they didn't, as in the study that I'm showing you on the screen, they didn't look at its effect on epigenetic mechanisms. And while they did find an increase in the concentration of lipopene in serum and tissue of patients with prostate cancer and BPH, they found no correlation between the levels of lycopene and the ability of lycopene to eliminate some DNA oxidation products. So while there is a voluminous literature of the role of various dietary components in animal studies, there is not that much, or I should say there's also a lot available with regard to human studies but a limited amount of information that I've been able to find, you know, find thus far, I'd be happy to hear from you um, if you come up with others, 
of looking at these dietary or nutritional components on epigenetic mechanisms. Now, in conclusion, I think that we can just sort of generally look at the use of epigenetics to fight cancer in the areas of diagnosis, prognosis, pharmacogenetics, and drug targets. Some of the ex ex examples are, are shown here. Um, some of the information that we have. And so I think that there is a definite indication, without a doubt, that nutrition has an effect on epigenetic mechanisms in, in, in prostate cancer. The question here is, is to try to look further at, at these effects for which there's a paucity, unfortunately, of information, or at least uh, which I could come up with. So in conclusion, uh, you know, there's a saying that um, th there's no beginning or end. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift, that is why it's called the present. And I hope that with some of this information uh, that came across clearly illustrates the role that nutrition may play in epigenetic mechanisms in cancer and specifically prostate cancer. So I thank you very much for this opportunity to come back and represent my lecture and I hope that uh, it was cogent enough uh, to maybe create some enthusiasm with regard to looking into some of the things that I've discussed today. So thank you very much. We appreciate very much your talk. Thanks a lot. And uh, <clears throat> we hope to have another occasion to, to meet physically each other. We hope to have uh, in Italy you soon, OK? Thank you very much.